to introduce James Jarvis. Uh, uh, prior to this talk, he graduated from Virginia Commonwealth University, Richmond, with a background in biomedical engineering, uh, which is truly a, a cross specialty at the intersection of several disciplines like this talk reflects. After which he went to Virginia Medical School before uh, coming here to start his surgical residency. Uh, throughout his education, he has been at the forefront of his uh, a class with several awards, uh, uh, such as I didn't realize he's an APSA champion, <laughs> and he also uh, was awarded with American Medical Association Foundation Scholarship 2014 and several awards uh, in between. But what is more important, what, what doesn't reflect in the uh, CV is his incredible work ethic. Uh, it has always been a pleasure to work with James and uh, he's calm and composed um, and uh, excellent bedside manners. And I never, you know, I only hear good things from uh, patients. Even when I don't ask them, they, they come out and say, who is this resident? He's so wonderful with excellent bedside manners. Uh, two recent cases, uh, you know, we both were involved. One was uh, uh, a patient who coded, and uh, I think patient survived because he he was there as a first responder. A call from my IR with the axillary artery rupture. The way he handled it was incredible for for a senior level PGY3 uh, when he was transitioning to four. Uh, you know, in a situation, and more recently we had a very a dying patient and his presence uh, when that man was dying was incredible. Some of these things are more important than what CV can tell. Uh, about coming to this topic, uh, this is a highly relevant topic and uh, uh, it's been a while we uh, went, you know, we have a topic like this about the art and science and history of surgery. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, this talk is about is the biography of uh, surgery how uh, a sapiens became surgeons. Uh, without uh, further delay, and uh, uh, James Jarvis. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Um, I'd just like to confirm that, first of all, everyone can hear me and that you can see my slides. All right, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks again, Dr. Rao, for the, for the introduction. Um, so we'll be talking today uh, about surgery as depicted in art from the butchering art to evidence based techniques. Okay. So I have no disclosures. So my objectives today for my talk are to uh, give a broad overview of surgical history as depicted throughout hu really human history in various art forms. We'll discuss uh, seminal events in the course of our history that have completely changed the public's perception of surgeons um, and talk a lot about how we've been perceived over time by the public and how we've been depicted by artists over time as well. We'll talk a little bit about future implications as well. So just starting out with the introduction. So as we all know, healthcare emerged early on as two discrete branches, medicine and surgery. And surgeons through most of our human history have always been viewed in a different light than physicians, at least until relatively recently. Surgery from early on was sort of defined by its ability to cure by bodily invasion, as Atul Gawande put it, um, and you know, kind of distinctly from medicine um, early on. So anyone that knows me knows that I like to go back to etymology a lot <laughs> and look at word roots. Um, so the word surgery dates to the 14th century from the Middle English period, from the Latin chirurgia, which ultimately derives from Greek, kairos meaning hand, and ergon meaning work. So even from the very beginning of its definition as a word, surgery is considered to be handiwork or the work of the hand rather than of the head, um, as was put by one author. So why I talk about art and a surgical grand rounds presentation? Um, I think that this topic is, um, as Dr. Rao said, is uh, relevant to us in a lot of ways. I think especially in this age of physician burnout being sort of a, a common buzzword, um, I think it's important for us to 
return to the sort of humanity uh, that makes us physicians and surgeons. I think often we forget the reasons that we uh, were led to pursue medicine in the first place when we're kind of caught up in the daily shuffle of, you know, the electronic medical record dealing with bureaucracy. It's I think it's often refreshing and invigorating, um, at least for me personally, to look at sort of where we've come from as a specialty and to kind of relate it all back to the humanity um, that makes us doctors. A couple of quotes here that I thought were relevant. Um, Art has always been the raft onto which we climb to save our sanity. I, th I think, you know, speaking of physician burnout, that certainly is a very pertinent quote. And by Picasso, art washes away from the soul the dust of everyday life. So what I hope to convey today in my talk is sort of how surgeons have been viewed by the public over time. Um, the progression from surgery being sort of a butchering art, as one author put it, to a true scientific discipline uh, practiced by, by surgeons. Um, you can actually see this progression over time by uh, looking back through art history uh, related to surgery. And the art really provides us a way to sort of understand how society viewed surgeons, how the general public viewed surgery, um, some of the common fears, thoughts, and attitudes regarding surgery. And I think, again, surgical history provides us a nice sort of escape from our daily routine and sort of mental stagnation and ennui that can often be associated with uh, regular practice. So most of the talk will be going through this timeline of surgical history. My goal here is not to give an exhaustive account of every major innovation in surgical history. Um, instead, I try to sort of guide through um, our development as a specialty with frequent references to sort of famous works of art and uh, we'll kind of go through it together. So we'll begin in the beginning as is appropriate, um, sort of the Neolithic era. Uh, people call it the pre-classical period. So it's widely felt that early Homo sapiens likely did possess some rudimentary skills to preserve life in case of injury. Probably the first um, you know, birth of surgery came from traumatic injury management. Now, as we transitioned as a society from a hunter-gatherer sort of dynamic into a settled society with agriculture, people began to have more time on their hands and began to uh, develop occupations and specialties. Um, and that is sort of when, you know, medicine and surgery began to come about. Um, there are depictions of ancient surgery. Um, a, a lot of which we've unfortunately has been lost over time. However, we do have some evidence from, um, you know, sort of ancient skulls of trephination, which we'll talk about, um, as well as uh, pictorial evidence of circumcisions. So this is a depiction, this is an artist depiction of trephination. And for those of you who don't know, this is an early practice, interestingly practiced around the world and completely distinct societies. There's evidence of you know, holes being bored in, in the skulls of people in ancient Peru, as well as people in ancient Europe. Um, so very fascinating. The exact indications for trephination, um, you know, in the year 10,000 BC are unclear today. Um, it's theorized that it may have been done for anything from mental illness to epilepsy to intractable headaches or even spiritual reasons. Um, we interestingly, um, over half of the skulls that bear these holes have rounded edges, suggesting that the patient lived through the procedure enough to heal the edges of their of their wounds. Um, and interestingly, uh, you know, that that means that greater than 50 percent of people not only survive the procedure, but, you know, live to carry it forward. It's likely that Neolithic surgeons also performed other surgeries. However, um, you know, we only have what's in the sort of fossil record, if you will, in the skeleton record. Now, moving forward several thousand years, um, some of you may recognize this is a black steel that actually has the code of Hammurabi uh, written on it. This is a famous sort of monument to that from ancient Babylon. Hammurabi was king of Babylon in the 20th century BC. And the reason that I bring this into this talk is because what's really fascinating about the code of Hammurabi is that there's a very large uh, section in it that deals with physician malpractice and specifically surgical malpractice. Um, and to quote here from the Code of Hammurabi, 
if a surgeon makes a large incision with an operating knife and kills his patient, his hands shall be cut off. Um, so there was an early um, sort of idea of surgeons having, um, you know, a very important role in society um, and also, you know, sort of being held up to some sort of quality standards. Another interesting thing about the Code of Hammurabi is that it, it lists physicians and surgeons as entirely discrete and separate occupations, with physicians being sort of learned and dealing with books and theories and surgeons being more practical and often illiterate. This is uh, a hieroglyph from ancient Egypt, actually from the city of Memphis, dating to about 2500 BC. And it's actually the earliest pictorial representation that we have of a surgical procedure. And clearly you can see this is a circumcision, um, interestingly being performed in a sort of mass production or assembly line fashion, if you will. Um, there are multiple references in ancient Egypt to circumcision, and it's actually felt that this procedure likely originated there. Um, unclear again what the indications were early on, it was felt that it possibly improved fertility. This document is the Edwin Smith Papyrus, um, which is actually the world's oldest surgical document, uh, dates to 1600 BC, and again is from ancient Egypt. It in interestingly includes management of um, uh, an array of uh, illnesses, including traumatic fractures, traumatic brain injuries, as well as multiple scale uh, skin ailments, rather. So now fast forwarding uh, another thousand years or so, in ancient India, um, there was actually a surgeon by the name of Sashruta, who's pictured here, um, who was very ahead of, of his time. He's well known as the father of plastic surgery today. Um, this is roughly the 8th century BC. His work, which was the uh, Sashruta Samhita, um, is the oldest text in the world on plastic surgery, with descriptions of greater than 1,000 distinct illnesses. His surgical techniques that he described, you know, way back in 800 BC include incision and drainage of abscesses, tooth extraction, amazingly hernia surgery and prostatectomy, um, as well as uh, rhinoplasty, which his method of rhinoplasty um, ultimately led to techniques that are still in use today. Moving forward in our timeline, we get to sort of the classical period, which I think a lot of people when they think about the history of medicine, they go back to Hippocrates. So I think a lot of this will kind of be familiar to you. Early concepts that came about in this period were the humoral theory, the idea that you know the body has four humors that have to be kept in balance for, for health, as well as this belief in sort of, quote, laudable pus, that separation or infection was essential for healing. Um, that came about around this period. We'll talk a little bit about Hippocrates as well, who lived in the fourth uh, century BC. So this is an, art an artist's depiction of Hippocrates performing an abdominal exam on a pediatric patient. He wrote uh, many treatises. Um, the body of his work is now known as the Corpus Hippocraticum. He included uh, works uh, discussing management of wounds, ulcers, hemorrhoids, um, anal fistula, uh, traumatic brain injury, and setting of fractures. He was actually the first to describe the use of aceton uh, for anal fistula, as well as cauterization for hemorrhoids. This is a Byzantine monk uh, a recreation of the Hippocratic Oath in a sort of Christian format that dates from the 12th century. And I think the Hippocratic Oath is a very interesting um, thing to discuss here. I think probably most of us, when we graduated or began medical school, we took the Hippocratic Oath out of tradition. And I'm not sure how many of you remember the words that you spoke in the oath, but to quote from the Hippocratic Oath, I will not use the knife, uh, even verily on sufferers from stone, but I will give place to such as are craftsmen therein. So even in our own Hippocratic Oath as physicians, we swore that we would not to use a knife upon a patient and instead leave that to the craftsman. So, you know, this is really interesting to me. There was this early distinction between physicians and surgeons. Physicians felt that to, you know, make an incision on a patient was sort of sacrilegious and it was better left to someone who was, you know, maybe trained in that sort of way, but not medical at all. 
So moving forward into ancient Rome, um, this is probably the most famous surgeon from that time period. This is an artist depiction of Galen. So Galen lived in the second century AD, and he was actually a Greek physician who treated uh, gladiators uh, from the arena. Um, he made monumental contributions to ancient surgery as well as medical knowledge. However, a lot of his were, uh, sort of findings that he propagated and put into literature were unfortunately incorrect assumptions. Uh, probably the most famous one is that uh, between the right ventricle of the heart and the left ventricle, there were invisible pores that allowed blood to pass from uh, one side to the other. There was no concept early on of the pulmonary circulation. This misconception was actually propagated forward for about 1500 years after Galen's death before it was finally corrected. This is a second century uh, marble bust um, uh, that actually is probably one of the earliest depictions of a physician examining a patient with a, a, an abdominal exam. You see a physician uh, performing an abdominal exam on a pediatric patient with a swollen abdomen. Off to the right there, you actually see a cupping vessel, which was a, a common procedure performed in ancient times for all kinds of uh, ailments. So after the fall of Rome, in 476, as we know, Europe sort of went into what we call today the Dark Ages, where there was not a significant progression in knowledge and science for several centuries. However, one place that knowledge continued to grow and that we as a people continued to make significant progress in medicine and surgery was in the Middle East. Um, here pictured is an Islamic surgeon, um, al -Bakasis. Um, his actual name is Abu al Qasim al Zarawi, um, but sort of his Latinized name that we know today is Alba Casis, and he lived in the 10th century AD. He wrote extensively on surgery and really brought a lot of legitimacy to the field as it started to develop. And sort of his philosophy was reviving the wisdom of the ancients. So he, you know, revived a lot of the work of Galen and Hippocrates and carried this forward. and. Interestingly, he was actually the very first person to describe tracheostomy, um, the eradication of breast cancer with cautery. Um, so, you know, very much ahead of his time, but he also continued to sort of propagate forward some of those Galenic errors that we discussed. Now, meanwhile, medieval Europe was kind of in a, in a completely different place. And this is what's, you know, sort of inspired me to go into this talk is just how fascinating this is. Um, so early Christian doctrine was vehemently opposed to anatomical study. Um, the church decreed that surgery could not be practiced by the educated monks who were basically the bearers of education at that time, leaving surgery to be practiced by uneducated people. Um, and this is where you had the advent of the barber surgeon. So in addition to performing shaving and haircutting, these people began to practice surgery. Um, and there's multiple references in the literature also at this time of surgery being performed by, um, they, they go by various names, by quacks, charlatans, roving itinerants. Uh, so there's sort of uh, an interesting dynamic here of how surgery was done in medieval Europe during this time. This is depicted in this uh, beautiful painting uh, that depicts uh, a Dutch country surgeon. It's meant to show it, you know, sometime in the 14th century. What I like about this painting is in the foreground on the right, you see the master surgeon performing an incision and drainage of an abscess on a very uncomfortable appearing patient. <laughs> on the on screen right, you have his assistant there who's preparing a bandage for the patient. And in the background on the left, you actually see an assistant who's preparing a patient for bloodletting. Throughout the house, you see various trappings of the country surgeon at that time, various flasks and then likely early, you know, anesthetic, you know, probably alcohol. Um, so it was a very sort of different practice and very different from what modern medicine was at that time uh, that the barber surgeons were practicing. So as medieval Europe, you know, continued to evolve, medicine began to really sort of find its own place. Uh, medicine began being taught in, in universities. Uh, physicians were signified as, you know, wearing these long flowing robes and speaking Latin versus uh, barbers or the barber surgeons were considered to be craftsmen. They were often illiterate. They only spoke the common tongue. The sort of most common operations performed at this time were uh, sort of external, 
were for external ailments, so things like amputations and, and bloodletting. Uh, and again, in art, at least as we'll go through, surgeons were often shown to be, you know, as um, sort of quacks. So talking a little bit more about this, so we have several um, of the next few paintings that are going to show how physicians were depicted. So here's a physician treating a patient. This dates from the 13th century. The physician, you know, um, is a physician because he has long flowing robes. He has a special sort of hat to signify his university education. And we also know he's a physician because he has a young assistant with him. Remember that the Latin word doctor means teacher. Um, so there's a, you know, sort of a inherent uh, teaching that comes with being a physician. Here again are two physicians uh, shown having a discussion. Interestingly, this is actually supposed to be a depiction of Galen and Hippocrates uh, discussing. And you can tell that they're physicians by their flowing robes um, and as well as their sort of white flowing beards that makes them look very sage like. This is from a fresco from the 13th century in which uh, it was said that, quote, a doctor who is a lover of wisdom is the equal of the gods. So you can certainly see how highly physicians were held even early on um, in medieval Europe. One common theme in some of the art from this time period is physicians performing examination of urine. This was known as uroscopy, um, and it entailed physicians examining urine by its visual appearance, and supposedly they could diagnose just about any disease from the appearance of a patient's urine. In this picture, you see death actually presenting this urine flask to the physician, sort of in a mocking tone saying, you know, basically, how do you think you can help this man who's already in my power? Here again are two different uh, distinct examples of how physicians have been portrayed, you know, examining this flask of urine and being able to reportedly diagnose just about anything from that. Of course, visual examination of urine, as we know, sort of lost its favor as uh, the introduction of chemical and physical analysis of urine, as well as microscopy several hundred years later. So we've seen how physicians were depicted during the medieval times. Now, this is an interesting engraving because it shows medicine and surgery coexisting. So this is the interior of a uh, 16th century hospital. Um, on the right bottom corner, you see a surgeon uh, depicted uh, dressing a head wound with an assistant. Also in the bottom left corner, you see another surgeon performing an amputation. Notice that the surgeons are sort of dressed in their barber surgeon outfit. Um, they have tools, um, they're shown basically to be craftsmen. In the immediate foreground in the center, you have three physicians who are again holding a flask of urine, which kind of signifies their uh, belief that they could diagnose from that. But also you see their flowing robes, their sort of special hats. And again, that uh, signifies them to be men of high education, university educated. So a very strong distinction here between physicians and surgeons. This is a caricature of surgeons um, that comes from roughly the same time period drawn by Anonymous um, that actually shows barber surgeons and their patients as monkeys, sort of as a way to, you know, I think the artist here is trying to say that you're a fool if you seek out these, you know, these roving surgeons to have any sort of medical treatment. Some of you may recognize these works, so uh, probably the most famous one is on the right here. This is known as the Extraction of the Stone of Madness and it's by Hieronymus Bosch. It dates from the uh, 16th century, and it's meant to depict this idea of uh, itinerant surgeons removing uh, stones from people's head. People back then often thought that mental illness was actually caused by, quote, rocks in the head, and it was felt that, um, you know, that barber surgeons sometimes exploited people and um, you know, performed this needless surgery to remove rocks from the head. So on the right there, you see uh, the surgeon wearing a, a funnel of wisdom, as it was known, uh, sort of as a way to kind of uh, make fun of barber surgeons. Um, you can see uh, you know, there's a gentleman next to the patient holding a flagon, probably of some sort of ale as an early anesthesia. And there's also a nun who's observing the surgery with a book on her head. Uh, sort of as a mockery to their uh, barber surgeon's uh, inability to read often, uh, being illiterate. On the left, you see another uh, barber surgeon removing a stone from the forehead of an unfortunate patient. My favorite thing with this painting on the left is that if you look in the bottom left corner, there's actually a certificate there 
that proclaims that surgeon's qualifications to practice surgery, and it's actually a counterfeit. Um, so in both of these paintings, the artist had very strong opinions regarding uh, the ability of surgeons. So then how did Europe finally kind of awaken and start to have you know flourishing of scientific thought? We know this as the Renaissance. So in the 15, uh, sorry, the, roughly the 15th century, beginning in Northern Italy, uh, there began to be just an absolute uh, propagation of, of, of wisdom and science and art. Uh, and this is widely felt to be the transition from the medieval world into our modern civilization. And there was this beautiful sort of revival of the arts and humanities and scientific thought. And, you know, probably the person that's most well known for this time period is Leonardo da Vinci. So he's pictured here in the 15th century. And as we know, he had a very observational approach to science. And specifically for surgery and medicine, he made over 240 detailed anatomical drawings from his cadaveric dissections, which were not uh, supported by the church at the time, keep in mind. Um, and he also wrote over 13,000 words in various treatises uh, regarding uh, gross anatomy. And I think what's important to remember about Leonardo is that he made this permanent link exist between art and medicine. These are details from uh, Leonardo's notebook of uh, beautiful sketchings from his dissections, and you can really see the detail. Nothing like this had ever really been done before. Um, you saw some of the, the older art, you know, this exquisite detail was really um, sort of cutting edge for the time. Someone that was sort of, you know, maybe well more well known to history for the Mona Lisa also, you know, constructed these beautiful drawings. Here's a fetus, a fetus in utero. Um, and really advance the field significantly. Um, a surgeon who significantly advanced standing of surgery um, in, in Europe at the time, this is Andreas Vesalius. So Vesalius was a 16th century uh, surgeon um, who absolutely rewrote human anatomy. Um, you know, he was well educated in Arabic, Greek, and Latin and really did a lot for the field in terms of defining, uh, you know, more discrete um, scientific understanding of anatomy. These are two pages from his work, um, which was known as the De Humani Corporis uh, Fabrica Libri Septum, uh, rolls off the tongue, uh, from 1543. And you can see these beautiful drawings of cadaveric dissections and really interesting poses. Um, his detailed dissection of cadavers and representation of his results did a significant amount for expanding surgical knowledge at the time. Probably the single most important surgeon in uh, medieval Europe in terms of, you know, developing the idea of modern surgery is pictured here. Ambrose Paré, again a 16th century surgeon uh, from France. What's really fascinating about Paré is that he actually began as an uneducated barber surgeon. Um, he apprenticed in that role, uh, gained battlefield experience, and however, became educated and learned Latin and ultimately kind of rose through the ranks, ultimately to become appointed to a surgeon uh, to the king of France. And probably uh, Paré's greatest contribution to us that is still relevant is that he Two things. One, he actually first described the use of a suture ligature uh, for bleeding vessels. Up until that time, people were using cautery or boiling oil for uh, to, in order to stop hemorrhage. But probably more importantly, Paré was the first person to take the Salius's work, translate it from Latin into the common tongue, which allowed barber surgeons of the day to really take advantage of you know Vesalius's uh, excellent work. This is the first uh, English version of Paré's work, um, uh, which actually came out during his lifetime. So meanwhile, in England, uh, the company of barber, sorry, the company of barbers and the company of military surgeons joined together in 1540 through a, a royal charter signed by King Henry VIII, um, who's pictured here. And this famous artwork is meant to sort of depict that monumental event. Now, the Company of Barber Surgeons, which was formed in 1540, the reason this is important for us today, this is the first time that a licensing body existed in the field of surgery to promote quality. 
and to really regulate the practice of surgery all the way back to 1540. So surgeons, you know, began to really uh, gain some legitimacy uh, to their field. Another sort of regal encounter that uh, really brought a lot of legitimacy and popularity to surgeons uh, was with uh, Louis uh, XIV, aka the Sun King, uh, from the 17th century in France. King Louis XIV developed a very painful anal fistula that his court physicians tried multiple ointments and poultices uh, to no avail. And ultimately, he ended up consulting uh, uh, a surgeon by the name of Felix, who uh, was planning to perform a fistulotomy for the king. Interestingly, this surgeon had actually never performed an anal fistulotomy, uh, other than maybe seen a few. So he actually first practiced the procedure on 75 men, most of which were prisoners at the time, before practicing it on the king. Within one month, the king was back on his horse after having his fistula you know, laid open. Um, he recovered beautifully, and he later uh, opened the Royal Academy of Surgery, which is now today known as the National Academy of Surgery, um, which certainly uh, gained a significant amount of legitimacy to the field of surgery. And actually on display in France today is still the knife that was constructed for this momentous occasion by Felix. So this is the actual instrument that was used to uh, lay open the Sun King's fistula. So, this idea of surgeons being seen as completely separate from physicians did continue to persist. So this is from that same time period in 17th century France. On the left, you see the depiction of the surgeon who is literally covered in his instruments and the tools of the trade at the time. Versus on the right, you see a depiction of the physician whose robes are literally made of books. Um, on his left hand, you, on his left arm, you see Galen's name. On his chest, you see Avicenna. So you see these sort of famous physicians, and he basically embodies medical knowledge. And the, even the words that come from his mouth, you can see, really carry a lot of wisdom versus the surgeon who is just kind of sort of covered in his tools. No talk of medical and surgical history would be complete without discussing, you know, m monumental achievements by uh, physicians of the day. So this is William Harvey, who, in, who was an English physician in, in the 17th century, who finally overcame and refuted the uh, theories from Galen regarding circulation of the blood. William Harvey was the first to sort of uh, scientifically prove that uh, blood was uh, carried through arteries and veins and that there was a separate pulmonary circuit rather than invisible pores for the blood to pass from the right to the left side of the heart. Another significant surgeon who made significant contributions in this time in the 18th century pictured here is John Hunter. So he is considered to be the father of scientific surgery. He, he had massive accomplishments in surgery as well as comparative vertebrate anatomy, um, as you can see from his picture. He's probably best known to us as surgeons today uh, because of his eponym, Hunter's Canal. Um, in the leg, given his significant work on uh, the treatment of popliteal artery aneurysm through ligation of the superficial femoral artery. So as we begin to move into more of the 18th and 19th century, you start to see surgery be, uh, significantly gaining legitimacy. However, there was still this feeling in the public, rightfully so, that to, to seek out the care of a surgeon, you were really putting yourself at risk. This is a poem that was written in the, in the 19th century, rather, by a Ben Johnson. When men a dangerous disease did scape of old, they gave a cock to esculape. Let me give two that doubly am got free for my disease's danger and from thee. So this idea of sacrificing a rooster to the god of medicine and surgery if you survive your illness as a sign of thanks, but maybe sacrificing a second one if you were lucky enough to survive your surgeon's efforts as well. And, you know, this time period as we move into the 19th century was still, surgery had come a long way, but it was still really sort of, um, you know, held back by two significant problems. Pain during surgery, uh, a lack of good anesthesia, of course, and overwhelming infection that really troubled surgeons of the day. So moving into the 18th century here, um, this is called the amputation. Um, and this is a really great depiction of how, how the public felt about surgeons at the time. You can see the surgeons are kind of huddled around the patient and putting him through an unnecessary surgery with 
you know, sort of crudely amputating an otherwise perfectly healthy leg. And probably one of my favorite details from this uh, painting, or this drawing rather, is the list of approved surgeons behind, behind the crowd on the wall. You can see surgeons by the name of Frederick Fistula, um, Christopher Catgut, and Peter Putrid, who have all been approved to practice. So the artist clearly had a not very uh, favorable opinion of surgeons at the time. James Syme, who's pictured here, was a Scottish surgeon who developed the Syme amputation of the lower extremity. Um, this is a quote from a professor, uh, George Wilson, uh, very uh, well written, obviously, from uh, 1843. And I won't read the whole thing to you, but sort of this end part. He's describing his uh, experience of living through an amputation in the pre-anesthetic era. Um, so he says, I still recall with unwelcome vividness the spreading out of the instruments, the twisting of the tourniquet, the first incision, the fingering of the sawed bone, the sponge pressed on the flap, the tying of the blood vessels, the stitching of the skin, the dismembered limb lying on the floor. So surgery, to live through surgery at this time was truly horrific. Um, and I think this really captures that. In 1846, however, was the uh, first procedure performed under anesthetic. This is an artist's depiction of that. This was performed in uh, Boston on October 16, 1846. Um, and, and this painting is known as Ether Day. Uh, the idea that using ether to keep patients comfortable during surgery was beneficial. And probably the interestingly, when you read observers' accounts of these early anesthet anesthetic procedures, people were really struck by how quiet surgery was. Before this, surgery was well known to sort of be, you know, traumatizing to witness. Patients were thrashing and screaming. And with the onset of anesthesia, surgery suddenly became still and silent and very meticulous. Not all surgeons picked this up, however. This is Robert Liston, who was a Scottish surgeon in the 18th century, or 19th century rather. rather. He believed anesthesia to be a, quote, Yankee dodge and felt that, you know, the way he practiced was just fine. Um, he was well known for his ability to remove a leg in under 30 seconds without the use of a tourniquet. He instead would use his left arm uh, as a sort of makeshift tourniquet and quickly cut through the leg. He's also the only surgeon um, in history, and some of this may be, you know, uh, uh, legend, but he's the only surgeon known to have a 300% mortality rate from a procedure. During a very quick leg amputation, he accidentally amputated one of his assistant's fingers. The patient subsequently died of blood loss. The assistant died of gangrene, and someone in the crowd watching reportedly died of shock. So the only surgical procedure in history with a 300% mortality rate. Oh. Around this time, we have Louis Pasteur, who was neither a physician nor a surgeon, but he made monumental advancements in our understanding of and development of germ theory. He was the first to suggest that bacteria uh, were the source of infection in 1864. Um, and this, you know, really began to address that second major problem of surgery with infection. The first surgeon to really put this into practice was Joseph Lister, who was an English surgeon. Uh, in uh, the 19th century, who in 1867 published a paper in The Lancet uh, entitled Antiseptic Principles in the Practice of Surgery. Lister uh, sterilized his instruments in carbolic acid and also frequently sprayed carbolic acid on the surgical wound during surgery. He also impregnated his dressings with carbolic acid. All of these methods together significantly reduced um, uh, morbidity and mortality from uh, surgeries of the day. Uh, a great book that I would recommend to anyone um, that partially inspired this talk is by Lindsay Fitzharris. It's known as The Butchering Art, and it's a biography of Joseph Lister. And in her book, she says, quote, Lister's methods transform surgery from a butchering art to a modern science, one where newly tried and tested methods trumped hackneyed practices. Meanwhile, back in the United States, despite all this progress in Europe, we were a little bit slower to uptake the latest in uh, scientific medicine at the time. This is probably the most famous work in uh, medical uh, art. This is known as the Gross Clinic. I think probably most of you have seen this painting. It was uh, painted by Thomas Eakins, and it's actually on display here in Philadelphia at the Art Museum. 
Um, it depicts Dr. Samuel Gross, who was a professor of surgery at the Jefferson Medical College, performing a procedure on a young uh, child with uh, osteomyelitis of the femur. You can see, uh, keep in mind, this painting uh, was done about 10 years after Joseph, Lister's, uh, Joseph Lister had established aseptic principles in surgery. You can see that Dr. Gross is wearing his street clothes. He has a bloodied hand. All of his assistants in surgery are also not really bothering with aseptic technique. Um, the couple of interesting details from this painting in the background, the only woman depicted in the painting behind Dr. Gross is actually the patient's mother, who shows this feeling of shock and awe uh, and sort of disgust with surgery. Um, this is an account from uh, a Dr. J.M.T. Finney, who trained roughly around this time um, at Massachusetts General Hospital, and he said that the operating surgeon was usually garbed in a black Prince Albert coat kept hanging in a closet for the occasion and showing numerous evidences of previous operations in the way of dried blood and wound secretion. Uh, so very, uh, uh, the United States was a little bit slow to uptake sort of these aseptic principles. This next painting is also by Thomas Eakins and is a very famous uh, work as well. So this is about 15 years after the Gross Clinic. This is known as the Agnew Clinic, and it depicts Dr. David Agnew, who was a surgeon at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, performing a mastectomy. And you can see how far uh, in the United States surgeons had come in the preceding 15 years. Notice that everyone involved with the surgery is wearing, you know, is wearing white. The instruments that they're utilizing are sterilized. You can see that the lighting in the room is significantly improved. One subtle uh, thing to pick up from this painting that's very fascinating is that in the last one, in the Gross Clinic, the only woman depicted was the patient's mother, and she appeared horrified. In this painting, the only woman depicted is actually a professional nurse, which depicts, um, you know, the birth of nursing as a respected profession and, you know, the increasing involvement of women in medicine and surgery. So we begin to enter this era now where surgeons are become, beginning to become not only more legitimized, but also uh, almost idolized in their uh, in artists' works. So this is Theodore Billroth, who was a famous Austrian surgeon um, who first described, as we know, Billroth reconstructions of the stomach. Um, he uh, uh, lived in the 19th century. This shows him at the height of his career, uh, practicing somewhat aseptic technique, it appears, although he did allow the public to still attend his surgeries. Um, he was the first to perform a successful gastrectomy as well as to excise a rectal cancer. Another famous surgeon at this time that we're familiar with is William Halstead here, um, who devised a modern operation for inguinal hernia as well as a radical mastectomy. And uh, very importantly, uh, first devised the idea of a surgical residency. Uh, this is a depiction of a Dr. Peen who is holding his instrument that he's known for here, which is the hemostat. So he first popularized the use of a hemostat. Here he is seen uh, lecturing before uh, performing surgery. So in this time period, surgeons began to contribute massively to medical progress. Whereas physicians had sort of few effective drugs at this time, this is the you know sort of pre-antibiotic era, surgeons were reporting new techniques and innovations almost monthly in the medical literature at this time and really began, began to gain some legitimacy. This brings us to another regal encounter at the turn of the 20th century. This is King Edward VII, uh, who two days before his coronation developed uh, a severe appendicitis. His surgeon was uh, Frederick Treves, who uh, was asking him to undergo surgery prior to his coronation. Uh, King Edward reportedly replied, I must keep faith with my people and go to the Win uh, to Win Westminster Abbey for my coronation. Treves replied, then sire, you will go as a corpse. Uh, sort of, that's sort of the famous quote. King Edward then after hearing that underwent uh, surgery for his app appendiceal uh, abscess after which appendix surgery became widely accepted and uh, you know, promoted by English surgeons in the, at the turn of the 20th century. So as we move into the 1900s, surgery begins to become more professionalized. There's an increasing focus on quality. The American College of Surgeons founded what ultimately became the Joint Commission, which still exists today. And again, uh, you know, sort of 
uh, regulates quality in hospitals. Um, a few Nobel Prize winners from this time period that brought a lot of legitimacy to surgery, Dr. Coker with his work on the thyroid, and Alexis Carell uh, for all the vascular surgeons on right now, um, sort of the, the father of vascular surgery with his work to um, you know, develop vascular anastomosis techniques. Now we're moving into the common era. So this is known as the operation by Oppenheimer. It was uh, painted in 1912. And you see here that um, surgery appears a little bit brutal and invasive, even with how far it's come. You can see the patient is in a very awkward sort of contorted shape in the middle. There's people all huddled around the patient. The artist wanted to suggest uh, in this painting that the surgeon and his assistants are invasive, brutal, anything but expert. So even with how far we had come as a profession, there were still artists who felt very strongly that you know this was not a legitimate profession at this time. What's very different, uh, this painting came out seven years, 17 years later. It's known as The Operation by Christian Shad. Here you see an absolute, uh, completely different uh, depiction of surgery. So here there's a patient undergoing an appendectomy. You're really struck by how sterile and clean the field is. Notice that the surgeons are not wearing hats or masks. However, they are wearing white attire and rubber gloves. There are several women present at the surgery and involved with the surgery. You see sort of the gray haired surgeon walking the junior surgeon through how to perform the procedure. So moving forward into this modern era, there was this increasing emphasis on specialization. Uh, there was there were significant innovations in traumatic wound management, a lot of which was from the world wars, World War One and Two, the development of plastic surgery as its own profession, the establishment of blood banks. Penicillin uh, came about uh, in 1928, um, and surgery here begins to move from a focus on extirpation versus restoration, and now we're sort of in this era of replacement in surgery. This is Harvey Cushing. Um, this is uh, he is well regarded to be the father of modern neurosurgery, who also began practicing during this time. This painting is from 1982, and it's called the Open Heart. Um, the idea of this is that everything is on the same plane, and the artist here was trying to depict sort of the controlled chaos that exists in the operating room, and he also wanted to represent the movement of contemporary society. Um, you can see this kind of interesting modern art with you know broad brush strokes and kind of intermingling of shapes and colors. Another interesting sort of modern depiction of surgeons, this is called The Surgeon by Perez, and it depicts surgeons as mechanics. So even with how far we've come as a profession, you know, this is a relatively recent painting still depicting surgeons as sort of mechanics, literally replacing a patient's engine here. Uh, very interesting depiction. Sort of the most recent or more recent artist work um, that I chose to look at here is known as the Surgeon at Work series. This was a series of paintings by a Dr. Joseph Wilder in the 1980s. This is this painting is called Removing Gloves, and this one is known as Contemplation Before Surgery. And I think this one's really interesting. This is from 1987. This shows the surgeon to be sort of thoughtful, meticulous, reverent, and really sort of taking a moment before starting surgery to kind of get his thoughts together and prepare for the operation. And I think this sort of shows the culmination of how far surgery has come over this uh, long period of time. So where do we go from here? So sort of the future directions of surgery, as we are all aware, you know, with increasing technological breakthroughs, increasing emphasis on minimally invasive techniques, endovascular approaches, uh, robotic surgery with tissue engineering. You know, we're now transplanting organs in people that have been grown from their own cells, such as the, the uh, trachea transplant several years ago. There's this increasing emphasis on quality and outcomes research that's sort of defining our field at this point. And we've certainly come a long way uh, from the beginning. Uh, so, you know, in conclusion, in summary, uh, what I've hoped that you know, I've been able to convey in this talk is that although surgery has been present throughout our history as a people, um, only relatively recently has it become normalized and accepted and even recently idolized um, in artwork. A couple of quotes here that I think kind of capture the how surgery has again advanced beyond what was previously felt to be possible. 
the abdomen, chest, and brain will forever be closed to operations by a wise and humane surgeon. And then actually, Bill Roth, 1880, a surgeon who tries to suture a heart wound deserves to lose the esteem of his colleagues. So I think it's really important for us to sort of, you know, keep this forward momentum, realize that surgery will continue to progress, but it's also important for us to understand the past of our profession. And I feel that that, you know, allows us to better sort of comprehend where we are as a, as a practicing occupation at this time and a profession, and also to understand our future direction. And, you know, with currently the average American expected to undergo seven operations during their lifetime, surgery has become a widely accepted and integral part of modern healthcare. And although emerging technologies will continue to arise, surgery will undoubtedly retain its roots as both a science and an art. And with that, I'd like to uh, say thank you um, to the many people who have helped me put this talk together today. Thank you to Dr. Rao for uh, you know, uh, taking, uh, giving me lots of feedback and helping me with my slides and uh, for your help with coming up with a lot of the beautiful artwork. Uh, thank you to my many mentors in the Department of Surgery here and um, elsewhere in medical school. And then lastly, but not least, thank you to my wife, Amanda, for listening to this uh, presentation probably three or four times and uh, for all of your helpful feedback. Um, and with that, I'd love to take any questions. Um, James, that was a wonderful talk. And, uh, you know, I can't tell you how much I appreciate. Not only that, you may feel better. I followed your talk. I kind of, uh, uh, my even my uh, college kid is watching your talk and he's so inspired. And actually, this kind of a talk should be part of curriculum in high schools and uh, colleges so that, you know, some of these people will be inspired to go into the field of surgery at different levels. And uh, if you look at it globally, 40% of uh, human suffering can be alleviated with one-time surgery. Hmm. And 80% of the global map is in red surgery in terms of what I mean is they don't have surgeons. Hmm. Um, you know, we may have to rethink how we train surgeons uh, in terms of duration and the curriculum so that these, uh, this, desperate need is addressed, even simple fistulas and uh, uh, lipomas go un unaddressed in a, in a bigger part of the world, uh, the United States. Uh, what I especially liked about your uh, talk is like the way you described the story of surgery using paintings. And, um, you know, you reminded me of uh, Sherlock Holmes walking into a crime scene. Um, and pays attention to little, little details. And even though I, fought, I, you know, I shared some of those paintings, I never saw those details myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you very much. And I, I deeply appreciated that. The second part is like, uh, in the historically visiting back the past, uh, uh, the difference between Vesalius and uh, Leonardo da Vinci was, uh, you know, da Vinci was all over the map. He put his fingers into several things. And Andrew Vesalius was a true scientist, and he, he, his contribution, he literally liberated uh, surgery from the dark ages. You know, he's a monumental figure. And the other one you, you said in your uh, presentation is uh, Hunter. Uh, he's the father of modern surgery, and he's also father of vascular surgery. In some ways, I joke around, the birth of uh, vascular surgery happened in, in uh, Hunter's Canal. Uh, and... Uh, you know, this is really, really wonderful. I would love to hear other people's comments. And uh, and one more thing is that the residents, uh, please get that book or you can even listen to audio book, Butchering Heart. It is only four hours. You can you can finish that book when you're driving. You know, it is available in excellent uh, British accent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate that. James, Dr. Whitmer. Hi, Dr. Whitmer. Not so much a question, but a, a few comments. First of all, that really was an outstanding brief summary of the history of surgery, and you should be congratulated for all the background work and putting that talk together. It was really nicely done and, and very informative. Thank you. Secondly, obviously you can't include everybody in the history of surgery, but one notable person maybe bears mention, and that would be Dr. Netter, 
Netter, who was a physician and fused the art of um, painting and drawing into the teaching of anatomy. Most of us have studied Netter drawings to learn anatomy during our medical school year. So he's one notable figure that maybe should come into that talk of yours. And the other thing I was interested in, have been many years, is the concept of the surgeon as an artist. And we've had many, many examples of that in our own program, going back to Dr. Carl Glassman, who was the program director when, when Dr. Abdomisi and I were going through residency. He was an amazing watercolorist, later in pastels and a sculpture. Also, Dr. Shaw Morbadi, who is a notable watercolorist in this community. And most of you know Dr. Mammon is an amazing artist and photographer and painter. Mm -hmm. And also Dr. Jadawi, who's one of our general surgeons and up in the general surgery education office, so I think there are one or two of his pen and ink drawings. So we've had many good examples of the fusion of art and science through surgeons expressing themselves in art. And I just wanted to bring those few comments to everyone's attention. Yeah, I certainly appreciate yeah. your comments. And my guess is that, you know, sort of the visual understanding that we have to have as surgeons to sort of understand our, our art, if you will, I think that that probably has a lot of overlap with the other arts as well. So I think that it's surprising to me that we have such a strong presence in that regard. As well. I also mentioned um, Dr. Warsaw. Dr. Warsaw is a good artist as well, and you will notice up in the pack you his portrait of uh, Dr. Wes Clayton. And I think he really captured Dr. Clayton's uh, magnetic personality in the eyes and the pastels that he used to depict Dr. Clayton. So congratulations to Dr. Warsaw as well. Absolutely. Jarvis, this is Jake. Can you hear me? Hey, Jake. Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, thank you for such an educational, inspirational, and frankly, just enjoyable talk um, to listen to. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned uh, the more apprenticeship model during your, your presentation. And as the upcoming academic chief and someone obviously interested, interested in education, I'm interested in your thoughts on some of the benefits of the apprenticeship model and whether you think uh, we should or consider possibly returning to some sort of apprenticeship model and if that would be beneficial for us in surgical residency. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Jake, and I would agree that our profession sort of finds its roots in apprenticeship. Um, and I, I personally, you know, when I've been on rotations where I work with one surgeon closely repeatedly, have gained a significant amount from sort of uh, an apprenticeship sort of education. I think that having more experiences like that during our residency training that allow us to see sort of all aspects of surgical care following one sort of master surgeon, you know, and, and really getting to know them and operating with them and learning a lot of the tricks of the trade, if you will, I think that that is very powerful in education. And I think especially in surgery, um, it's monumental. I mean, compared to you know other medical specialties, I think the apprenticeship model makes a lot of sense for surgical education. So I agree with that. James, this is Dr. Mammon. Uh, excellent presentation. Going through uh, yeah, eons of uh, <laughs> development of the art of surgery. Um, you know, um, in uh, United Kingdom, surgeons are still called Mr., mm -hmm. not doctor, because of the, uh, you know, the influence of surgeons being barber surgeons in the past. So unless, of course, you become a professor, you are, um, you are still a Mr. <laughs> You're not, never called, only the physicians are called doctors. Um, and uh, I would make a, a make a uh, plea for people being more interested in developing that part of your brain, you know, because I think uh, surgeons have the innate ability to be uh, to depict things in in uh, drawings and paintings, mm -hmm. your thoughts, your your uh, uh, plan for a complex surgical procedure, your 
uh, documentation of a surgical procedure and training your eye, you know, in basically thinking three dimensions helps in actually your development as a surgeon um, yourself. And boy, let me tell you, uh, if it weren't for uh, uh, my interest in art, my retirement would have been a pure hell. <laughs> I appreciate your comments very much. Thank you. OK, um, any other questions or comments? Um, I, I would echo with uh, what Dr. Uh, Mammon was suggesting. Even uh, you know, all of us may not have the uh, fire in us to become a painter. But at least the simple art of doodling, you know, just, uh, you know, you're, you're getting a consent from a patient or, you know, very often I use this uh, a simple line sketches to demonstrate where a pancreatic tumor is or a lung uh, nodule is or a femoral artery stenosis and how you are doing a bypass. Mm -hmm. And the patients really treasure those drawings. And they they are very deeply appreciative, and because if you're just making an eye contact and uh, you know explaining their disease to them, and they feel nervous and uh, they don't want to uh, come across, uh, you know, say that they they did not understand or they don't want to repeat. And if you if you just make a little extra effort to draw a simple picture, it doesn't have to be like a Picasso's work. Uh, a, a simple doodling, you know, there are so many videos on the YouTube available how to sketch a human body. I get that few simple proportions right. Um, you know, patients really are appreciated. You know, when I do that, people in fact pass the pictures I draw for them to to other family members, mm -hmm. uh, so that they can say, "My doctor said this. I have this blockage, and that he's going to do this bypass." And uh, it is it is uh, it is usually well received. Absolutely. Dr. Jarvis, excellent presentation. Very, very good. Um, I have to applaud the uh, fact that uh, you have taken days. Uh, I, I really think it was amazing. Um, I also want to congratulate many of the residents who uh, also like some of the history of painting, but also have different hobbies that really will help them. Because as, uh, as Dr. Mamin was mentioning, um, it's one of the part of the ring that you actually need to develop too, but we have many people with many different skills that I have been finding uh, quite interesting and uh, uh, very interesting human beings, not only good surgeons that, that we are uh, helping to create here. So that was very good. That was very inspiring. Uh, good, great. I think uh, all the juniors actually are going to remember this word. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there aren't any other questions or comments, then we'll we'll wrap up shortly.